for three sticking with the right uh, wrong answer uh, situations. Counterfactuals, uh, this, this tendency for counterfactuals, what if scenarios, oh, I could have done better, oh, I could have gotten it right. It's such a strong tendency in humans that it can, it can mess up our reasoning in lots of domains. There's a really famous study showing, uh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, of gold, silver, and bronze medalists in the Olympics, when they called them and surveyed them about how happy they were with their performance, what do you think the ranking is? Right, exactly. It goes gold, bronze, silver. Which is interesting, right? The silver medalists finish better than the bronze, but the silver medalists generate counterfactuals of like, I could have finished first. For the rest of their lives, they're like, I didn't get the gold. You know, I they feel less happy with their performance than people who got the bronze because they're generating counterfactuals like, oh, I could have not placed it all. I could have gotten no medal at all. So you get this ironic thing where bronze medalists are happier than silver medalists, um, which wouldn't seem to make sense, but it totally makes sense if you understand the human mind at all. So, so we over remember wrong switching and under remember wrong staying, uh, even though switching is actually good in general, which I haven't really finished making the case for that yet, so you should still be suspicious. This is a picture of somebody they test a long time ago. I don't know. <laughs> anything to just kind of fill the screen. Okay, so in study two, they asked students which would feel worse, and they overwhelmingly reported switching when they should have stuck with the right answer over sticking with the right answer when they should have switched. Uh, so they asked them, you know, which one would make you feel worse? They say, yes, having the right answer and switching away from it, that feels worse than anything else. But then the question is, it's not just feeling worse, it's gotta be over-remembered somehow, right? Because you need to be generating this fallacy in your head that you're supposed to stick with uh, your first instinct. And it isn't necessarily the case that just because it's more painful not to do that, that you'll develop that fallacious uh, belief. It's gotta be the case that you over-remember these cases where you switch from the right answer and think that they happen all the time or really frequent, and then you develop this, this theory that you, you, know, you shouldn't switch, that you should stick with your first instinct. So in the case that people really do over-remember switching away from the right answer to a wrong one. So they gave participants part of an SAT and asked them to indicate two answers that they narrowed, uh, that they narrowed down to, like, and which one was the first instinct when they didn't uh, immediately know the answer. Give them an SAT, and then they say, okay, now for these ones where you get down to two answers, clearly indicate it, and then give your best guess. And, uh, yeah, uh, so then they were told the correct answers afterwards, and they were given time to, like, go back through these questions and say, oh, okay, for this one I got down to two, I went with this one, it was my, it was my first instinct, I got it right, this one's my second instinct, I got it right, you know, and they're able to, like, kind of rehearse this and get full feedback on what happened. Um, and then they're contacted four to six weeks later, they're told how many they narrowed down, and they say, okay, you narrowed, you know, you just took the SAT with us, like, four weeks ago, you narrowed 15 questions down to two answers. For those, uh, how many were cases where you stayed with the first one and got it right? How many were cases where you stayed with the first instinct and got it wrong? How many were ones where you went with your second instinct and got it right? How many ones where you went with your second instinct and got it wrong? What's their hypothesis? That they're going to overestimate how many times they stuck with their first instinct and got it wrong. Because that's specifically really painful and you tend to overremember it. And, okay, well, one thing is when they actually took the test, they tended to stick with the, right, the, the first answer more than switching, which was wrong because they actually, they actually missed more from sticking than switching. Uh, but the main finding is the memory bias. Participants tended to overremember how many times they had switched and got the question wrong relative to how many times they really did, and they tended to underremember how many times they had stayed with their right answer and got it wrong. So they tended to underremember how bad going with their first instinct can be. Um, so overall, they should have gone with their first instinct. Or sorry, they should have gone with their first instinct. They didn't. They tended to go with their first instinct, but then they misremembered what had happened. And actually, even though they were given full information, they misremembered what happened and tended to remember the opposite that happened. You know. Okay. So that's where we get this dumb theory that you should go with your first instinct. Despite evidence, full evidence to the contrary, we'll tend to remember uh, that we should have stuck with our first answer even when that wasn't the case. So the conclusion from this research, trust your later instincts, further thinking, be it conscious or unconscious, in this case conscious and the apartment buying study unconscious, is typically better than snap decision making. Remember it's the case that those thin sliced judgments of what the teacher's evaluations would be like at the end of the semester, they were, you know, not terribly off. You know, they were correlated with the final answer, but they didn't get it perfectly right. You do get more information on your environment, on a test, on what the right answer is, on an apartment buying scenario or some kind of choice situation. You do get more information when you think longer, be it consciously or unconsciously, and you do tend to make a better decision given a little bit of time. So some final thoughts on automaticity. Um, Automaticity research points to the sometimes amazing strength of non-conscious factors on behavior. Uh, however, it does not mean that we should believe in any sort of magical data finding. You know, uh, I think a lot of people went from this to, wait, they know that stuff about ESP is right. You know, because you can be non-consciously suggested and influenced with uh, stimuli that you wouldn't think would cause these effects. So maybe it's the case that things like ESP, telepathy, and so on are now plausible. Maybe they're all, maybe all of that is true, just like we always kind of suspect. But, uh, but no, uh, when you're, uh, there's no reason to do that. This any of this directly implies that, despite what some people have taken from it. And uh, when using a scientific approach, you should always look for strong empirical evidence. Uh, and a scientific approach involves skepticism regarding claims. And if you read these papers, you'll see they run three, four, five studies. They run like nine studies sometimes. They say, oh, you might be critical of the fact that we're using first names, and the causal direction might be the opposite. So we ran this study to address that. Oh, you I think that actually people felt comfort and liking, and that made them adopt the complementary body posture. So we read complementary body posture and show comfort and liking comes after that. They go and they address these alternative explanations that are, that are uh, advanced, that they advance themselves in criticism of their own work. They bend over backwards to prove themselves wrong in Richard Feynman's words, and that's how they do good convincing science. What wouldn't be good convincing science is to take some slipshod evidence and say it's evidence for extrasensory perception or something like that and try to get people to buy it. So scientists are expected to be self critical. This is the central part of the scientific method is relentless scrutiny of the conclusions you're making. And if you do this, when you do science, you'll be more convincing because you'll disarm your critics. Your critics will say, oh, I never even thought of that criticism of your research. You know, wow, you're, you're, you're doing self criticism even in excess of my criticisms. And so that's, that's the one way to do science is particularly attractive uh, to an audience. So that's the end of this line. We'll just we'll end this one a little bit early and uh, see you back on Tuesday. Oh.